activates to the spirit of a living God within us, that out through the vessel of our being, you pour forth your wisdom with mighty clarity. Well, thank you for we have wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of that spirit that you've so richly given to us in redemption. Our heart is full of gratitude and praise. And we do believe and receive that the burden of ignorance is de realized tonight to your glory. And everybody says, Amen. Well, uh, thanks for coming on tonight. Uh, we'll just get straight away into God's word uh, as we uh, just go through the pages of God's word together. First Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1. And I read verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and so still is our brother, unto the, unto the church of God which is at current, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be sins, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both dears and ours. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> uh, and don't forget, we are emphasizing and focusing on uh, two key thoughts in these uh, sets of verses. Uh, that that by which Sostenis is referred to, that's brother. And then secondly, the church of God. Now, the church of God is actually the assembly of brethren, the assembly of those who have been redeemed. Now, the Bible tells us something here. <clears throat> the Bible tells us something in verse 10. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. I want you to look at that one more time. Uh, it tells the believer, the saints in the local assembly at Corinth, uh, it says, in the name, it beseeches them, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means on the basis of the accomplishment of Jesus, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So all believers, we are to endeavor to speak the same things. We are to be uh, joined together perfectly in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now you want to tell me very quickly to Hebrews and uh, <clears throat> chapter, yeah, Hebrews and chapter 12. You go all the way to the last verse. It talks about our God being a consuming fire. Okay. What does he consume? He consumes all that was in opposition to our uh, receiving salvation. So it takes out of the way all the symbols, for example, all the symbolisms and all the ancient teachings takes it out of the way. Uh, because now, by the very appearance of Jesus himself, the symbols are gone. <clears throat> so it says, for our God is a consuming fire. Then it says in the next verse, chapter 13, verse 1, yeah, which is the next verse, it says, let brotherly love continue. So therefore, our God, as a consuming fire, is the brother, is the original brother. And we are to let that brotherly love continue. So God in the sacrifice of Christ, became our brother. Amen. God, in the sacrifice of Christ, became our brother, the consuming fire. So the consuming fire of God is welcome because it is a foundation of brotherhood and an act of brotherhood itself. You hold your hand in that place and go to Hebrews and chapter 2. And I'm going to go all the way down uh, to verse 11. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are, are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Look at that again. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So notice he is not ashamed to call us his brethren, saying, I will declare your name unto my brethren. So what are we to him? We are his brethren in the midst of a church. Will I sing praise unto thee? Uh, pay close attention to that. So he, in redemption, as the captain of our salvation and the sacrifice for sins, became the one that is not ashamed to call us brethren. As our sanctifier is the firstborn. And we are the brethren in that sacred brotherhood. We are brothers together with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Let me read Hebrews 2, 11 again. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. What does he call us, brethren? Is there any shame in that? Nope. It's not a shame to call us brethren. It's not because our conduct is perfect, but because we are made perfect in his own conduct. And we find our conduct in his. Anyway, so it says, For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause it's not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name unto my brethren. So we are the brothers of God. Go to chapter 13 then, Hebrews 13 and verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Now, so who is that brother? Jesus. So Jesus is the one who uh, became a man, the neighbor that saved us from our sins. So when the Bible says, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself, it was something that God himself fulfilled. How did he fulfill it? He became brotherly, right? He became our neighbor. And in that neighborliness, he delivered us from the power of sin. Now, if you go all the way down to verse 7, Still talking, remember, what's the instruction? Do not let, yeah, or rather I said, let brotherly love continue. That's verse one again. It says, let brotherly love continue. What love? That love that started in God, to which we owe our brotherhood, him as the first brother, we let that brotherly love continue. Look at verse seven. Remember them that have the rule over you. What's it teaching? Let brotherly love continue. So brotherly love will mean that I remember or call to mind those believers, those other brethren that have the rule over me. So it's an act of brotherliness, right? To remember those that have the rule over me. The other word used for that is honor. So really, so honor is brotherliness or brotherhood celebrated. So I remember them who have the rule over me. At what rule? They have spoken unto me the word of God. So what is the rule they have over me? They are speaking unto me the word of God. You see, anybody that comes to teach you, instruct you, train you in the word of God, yeah, is coming with that government of God, the rule over us. So who has spoken unto you the word of God? Whose faith follow? What do we follow? Their faith or their doctrine. So we follow their doctrine. Yeah, now considering the end of their conversation. So I have a job. I'm to consider the goal, the end, the exit. That's what that word really means. I'm to see that the doctrine they preach exits itself or showcases itself in their manner of life or their conduct. That is those that have the rule over me. So how am I supposed to relate to people that have the rule over me? I'm to remember them. Why? On account of what they've spoken. Yeah, and then what does that make me do? I follow after their faith. Notice, whose faith follow? It didn't say do everything they do. No, instead follow their faith. That means follow their sound doctrine. In other words, following the sound doctrine of those that train me in sound doctrine is brotherhood. It's brotherly love continuing. You see, in the love of God in us, Christ died for us. In that love, he also lives for us. In that love, we are in the local assembly. In that love, we listen to those that train us in the word. In that same love, those that train us in the word make it their duty to actually speak the word and nothing but the word. So he says, remember them that are the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, uh, with whose faith follow. So what are you supposed to do? Remember? Yep. Number two, follow. Number three, consider. So remember them. Uh, yeah. what, are you, what do you remember about them? That they've spoken unto you the word of God. What is the benefit that a pastor or evangelist, prophet, pastor, whatever it is you call your leaders, what is it that the pastor brings into my life? They speak unto me the word of God. So I don't take their words lightly. Say, so we have spoken unto you the word of God. I remember. What is my job? To remember, to call it to mind, to ponder upon it, to give it my attention. So I give my attention to those that have the rule over me. Why? On account of what they are going to say. What should they say? The word of God, sound doctrine. Now, what do I do as a result of my remembering? I follow their faith. That means I follow the sound doctrine in what they've said. How do I do that? I consider. 
So my consideration will result in two things. And the two things are still a product of brotherhood. Number one, I actually follow their faith. Number two, I do not follow that, which is not faith. Do you get it now? But both of them are expressions of brotherhood. So now that, the other name you can call this is simply honor. Okay? Now, so when you hear brotherhood and you hear honor and you hear love uh, for the saints, it's the same thing. Right? Now, it, uh, it says, remember them that have the rule over you. So I am to recognize that there are brethren in our midst who make it their duty to actually speak unto me the word of God. They labor in the word. They travail in the word night and day in order, uh, in order to communicate to me sound doctrine. My part is after they, or while they are communicating the sound doctrine, I remember. What, why am I remembering? I'm remembering uh, yeah, in order to follow. What am I following? Their faith. I'm not so much following them. I'm not so much following everything they say as much as I'm following faith. I mean, I'm following sound doctrine. In other words, my leader is meant to come unto me with the word of God. I, trained by them in the word of God, am meant to consider their work in the word of God and replicate that work in my work. What is it that regulates my leader? The word of God. What regulates me? The same word of God. What is my job? I'm to remember. Yeah, and in my remembering, I consider right? I consider. Now, I want, you to, I want you to look at that word that was translated, consider, in that Hebrews and chapter 13. Yeah, what am I supposed to do? I'm meant to remember. I am meant to remember. Hebrews 13, 7. What does that word remember mean? See, that word translated remember, yeah, it means, let me tell you, it, it, it means uh, that I am to be mindful of, I'm to call to mind. I'm to think of and to feel for. I'm to hold in memory. I'm to keep in mind and to make mention of. That's what I do. So I think upon what I've been taught, right? I think upon it. I remember Hebrews 13, 7. I remember what I've been taught. It's my job. Their job to teach, my job to remember, I re which means to ponder, to think upon. I remember them which have the rule over me, who have spoken unto me the word of God, whose faith follow, considering. Uh, what do I do? In my, in my remembering, I'm to consider. What do I consider? Well, look at it very carefully. It says we are to consider, right? What are we to consider? It says we are to, con firstly, what does the word consider mean? It, uh, to consider there, it means to look attentively, to consider well, to observe accurately. So in Hebrews 13, I'm making my duty to observe accurately the person teaching me the word of God. What in particular? Not, their, not their, the physical attributes of them, but what they are speaking unto me. So it's my job to look at and observe closely, give attention to way what is being taught unto me. So I consider as an act of brotherly love. I remember as an act of brotherly love. I follow faith as an act of brotherly love. Now, brotherly love, therefore, op operates in two ways. It follows where faith is found and it doesn't follow where faith is not found. In other words, brotherly love will look at the instructor and follow the instructor's sound doctrine. And where the instructor is not in sound doctrine, it doesn't follow. And both of it is brotherly love. He said, let brotherly love continue. And, and how does that, does that happen? I consider the end of their conversation. That means their manner of life. So it's my job to open my, my eyes wide and observe, right? Observe my leader. Now, my job is not to say, well, blindly, I'm going to close my eyes and say, well, if my leader says it, that's the way it is. Well, now, people want to do that, what well, is fleshly, but the spiritual things to do as in brotherly love is to remember and is to consider and to follow where faith is found. In other words, that which is not sound doctrine, we don't follow. Do you understand? Why are we not following? To follow that which is not sound doctrine will not be brotherly love. And what is to continue? Let brotherly love continue. You go all the way down to verse uh, 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. Stop. Obey them that have the rule. What is the obedience? It's in verse 7. Remember them. Right? Whose faith follow? Considering their end. That's the obedience. The obedience is not, well, 
my pastor said that I should uh, sit in the car overnight, right? And I should also make sure that I don't go to work for five weeks. Not exactly. That's no obedience. The obedience is scriptural. Am I to obey my leaders? Yes. I am to obey my leader as the word of God has told me to obey them. What did the word of God tell me to obey them? You see, we must allow scriptures to remain in the setting in which they've been given. Hebrews 13, 17 did not come out of thin air. It did tell us to obey and to submit. Now, what is the obedience and how do you measure the submission? How do you know a believer that is submitted to the, uh, uh, to the leaders? They will remember them, verse 7. Remember them that have the rule over you. Look at verse 7 again. Though them that have the rule over you. Look at verse 17. Verse 17 says, obey them that have the rule over you. So he's talking about the same people and my relationship to them. So in verse 17, he calls it obey. Amen. In verse 17, he calls it obey. He says, obey them that have the rule over you. Uh, what is that obedience? Submission. What is the submission? Well, somebody says that submission means everything, anything that the pastor says, you do it. No, because that will be plucking a verse out of thin air. Verse 7 already discussed me with respect to my pastor. What did he say in verse 7? It, the same Hebrews 13. Remember them. So I am mindful of them, right? What am I mindful of? They have spoken unto me the word of God. So the, their rule is in God's word. My remembrance is in what they've said that is God's word. Yeah, what do I then do? I follow their faith. I follow the sound doctrine. Meaning, what is not sound doctrine? I don't follow. How do I know? I consider the end of their conversation. So I'm watching them. I'm watching them and I'm observing them very closely, paying close attention. Now, look at that word again in Hebrews 13, 17. Hebrews 13, 17. Yeah, because in Hebrews 37, then, it said obey, right? Obey. So we are to obey. But you know what is funny? The word obey in Hebrews 13, 17 is quite an interesting Greek word. What does that word mean? It means persuade, to persuade. <laughs> to persuade, to induce one by words to believe. So somebody trying to use words to persuade you, to make friends of, to win one's favor to gain somebody's goodwill, to persuade unto, a persuasion unto something, to listen, to yield to, to trust, to have confidence. Now, can you see that that word doesn't look like what the English person reading verse 17 would think it means? Because the average person reading verse 17 thinks, eh, hey, look at that word obey, right? That word obey means there is lower and there is higher and what the general says, no, the word obey there is not the word that you use to, from a general to a sergeant. The word obey there really means be persuadable. Allow yourself to be persuadable. That, that's all he's saying there. When he says obey them that have the rule, he's saying be persuadable by them that have the rule over you. What are they going to use to persuade you? Verse 7, they speak unto you the word of God. Did you see it now? What is the job of a pastor? The pastor is using the word of God to persuade the saints into godly, God, uh, into godly conduct. Look at it again. Hebrews 13, 17, obey. Obey them that have the rule over you. You know, and if you're not careful, you would think that word obey there means uh, that uh, uh, the way that somebody commands another. No, no, no. Yeah. You see, you know, when people said uh, of Jesus that he trusted in God, let God deliver him now. For he said, I'm the son of God. You see, that word translated trust is that same word translated obey in this place. Yeah, when he says uh, um, uh, that I will persuade the governor and he, I, I will persuade him to secure you, yeah, that word is that same word that is translated obey there, right? Now, this is very funny. You know, when, when the Bible says that uh, in Luke 11, that when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcometh that, that person, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted. That's that word that was translated obey. Are you, are you getting the, the, the sense of that word? Yeah. Now, it is a very, uh, another word used for that is agree. Yeah. So it's a word that means to agree, to be persuaded, right? To yield, 
right? And it's a word that also means to trust. So let's go back to Hebrews 13, 7. It, it doesn't mean command. Mm -mm. So that when the Bible says, obey them that have the rule over you, it means those that are in that verse. Okay, we are staying in that verse. In Hebrews 13, 17, that obey there is not a response to command. No, it's a response to a persuasion from the minister, from the word of God. What is my job? I submit. What does it mean to submit? Oh, that is the word of God. I have considered it. Right? That is the word of God. I am following after. That is the word of God. I'm pondering on it. I agree. That's what will be there. In other words, it's saying that when somebody is teaching you the word of God, don't be aloof. Don't be distant because that will not be brotherly law. Are you following now? So when that word obey, eh, Hebrews 13, 17, where it says obey them that have the rule over you, right? That obey there is not that same word you have in a uh, it, it, that, that obey there simply means allow yourself to be persuaded. <laughs> That's all it means. Let yourself be persuaded. Be persuadable. Amen. Be persuadable. Very, very important. You see, because uh, look at Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6 and verse 1. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. You see, that word obey there, yeah, let me tell you what it means. The word obey there, when it says obey your parents in the Lord, it means uh, to hearken to a command. Yeah, to hearken to a command. So your parents come commanding and you hearken. Yeah, to one who on the knock at the door comes to listen. So it means parents knock, you come to listen. Yeah, you call to attention. So that, that's that word when it says children obey your parents in the Lord. That obey there is to hearken to a command. So yeah, to hearken to a command. Now, that is not the word used in Hebrews and chapter 13. In, do you understand? In Hebrews 13, go back there to verse 17, obey them. That obey there is not hearken to a command. No, the ruler is not commanding in Hebrews 13, 17. Instead, it's a word that means make yourself available to be persuaded. So I, 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 it is a misnomer and a misfortune, really, that uh, the King James guys, for whatever reason, uh, chose to translate that place as obey. Because uh, uh, some people then, not understanding that, read that passage and come away with a hierarchical relationship. I command you jump. Yeah. I command and you jump. You jump. Yeah. I, I am the general. You are the staff sergeant. Yeah. Now, let me read to you in, uh, in NIV. NIV says, have confidence in your leaders. Submit to the authority. Have confidence. Have confidence in your leaders. Now, let me read to you uh, what it says in the message translation. Be responsive to your pastoral leaders. Can you see? Respond to them. Don't be aloof to them. Don't say I'm immune to my leaders. That's what he's just talking about there. Allow them persuade you with what? The word of God. Amen. He said, be responsive to your pastoral leaders. Listen to their counsel. Now, uh, uh, let's look at it again under the J.B. Phillips. The J.B. Phillips says, uh, it, it says, he just used the word obey your, uh, your rulers. Right? Now, uh, it says uh, in, um, let me read to you the Passion Translation. The Passion Translation. The Passion Translation says, Obey your spiritual leaders. Now, so we see that uh, when the word is properly uh, uh, interpreted, as you have it in the NIV, right, the word really means that I am to have confidence in my leaders. Praise God. So rather than it being your response to a command, it is your heart attitude that trusts the leader. Like, what are you trusting them to be able to do? To persuade you. So when I come to the local assembly, I am making my heart available to my leader, for my leader to use the word of God to persuade me unto service in Christ Jesus. Let me look at it one more time. Hebrews and chapter 13 and verse 7. Verse 7 says, remember them that have the rule over you, right? That's what you have to do. So yes, somebody has a rule over me. What is that rule? They've spoken unto me the word of God. What is my place? I am to listen to what they've spoken. What is that called? Remember. So they've spoken. They, I, I must make sure they're not speaking as unto thin air. I'm to listen to them because guess what? The rule that my leader has in my life is the word of God that they speak to me. 
The rule of my leader is not an inherent quality that the leader was born with and by which I must bow. No, the rule of the leader is the leader persuading me, influencing me to learn the supremacy of the word of God that the leader is, uh, is teaching me. Amen. Or like Jesus told Peter, feed my flock. So the feeding of the flock, the response of the flock to the feeding is what is called remember. Why? The, the feeding is the speaking. They speak unto us the word of God and we listen. What am I doing? We follow their faith. We follow the soundness of their doctrine and we consider, we pay particular detailed focus attention onto their manner of life. So those are commands. We are to obey them. So when the Bible down says in verse 17, obey them, we know what the obedience is. The obedience is simply reminding us again that number one, we are to remember them. Number two, we are to recognize that their, their rule over us is the word of God. Number three, we are to pay attention to the God's word they've spoken unto us. Number four, we then make it our duty to follow sound doctrine in what they say. Number five, it means if it's not sound doctrine, we do not follow it. Number six, it means that I am to be, if I'm out, I know I'm properly exposed to good leadership. I grow up. And in my growth, I begin to learn, mm -mm, that's not the word of God. And that one is the word of God. Where, the, where what my leader is saying is the word of God, I actually yield myself to it, submit myself to it, and make myself available to my leader to be trained. Praise God. Yeah. And then the last thing we do there is we consider. We give them our, we give their conduct our utmost attention. So when a leader says, don't pay attention to what I do, that leader is not a leader. Biblical leaders that have the rule, the bishops, the pastors, the shepherds, whatever name you want to call them, they are people that we are to remember. Remember for their work's sake. That work is the speaking to us of the word of God. Our job is to follow faith, follow doctrine. Where the doctrine is not sound, you don't follow. Where the doctrine is sound, you follow. Why do you know how to follow or not follow? You consider the end. You consider the end. And what does the Bible then call all that in Hebrews 13, 17? Just uh, 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 some 10 verses after. Have confidence in your leaders. How will I have confidence in my leaders? Uh, actually, uh, 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 another way of saying is allow yourself to be persuaded by. Allow yourself to be persuaded by your leaders. Right? Because that is their rule. Right? Uh, what is the rule of a leader? That tendency, that slant, that dedication, that devotion, that consecration in the leader to come to me with the word of God. And what is my, what is my posture? My posture is my leader is talking. I'm going to give it all of attention. Why is my leader talking? That is the leader's brotherly love to me. My, I am a brother to my pastor. Why? Because I'm a brother to Jesus Christ. Look at it. Let's say it again. Hebrews and chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So what does he call us? Brothers. We are the brothers of Jesus. We are the brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ. He produced that brotherhood in his sanctification, which is the resurrection from the dead. Verse, uh, are you get it? Verse 12, saying, I will declare your name. That means I will announce your work unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. So the believer is the praise of God. And the, that brotherhood, that's the praise of God. And he declares the name of God to us in the brotherhood. So we get to know God as he is in the revelation of brotherhood which Jesus reveals to us. So Jesus calls us brethren. He is our brother. We are his, he is ours. So we are brothers and sisters of one another and he's a brother to us all. So you get to Hebrews 13 then, when the Bible now says in verse 1, let brotherly love continue. It is the love that produces brotherhood that we are to allow to continue. What does that love do in verse 7? In verse 7, that love makes a man stand up and exercise the rule over me in that the person painstakingly and in long suffering and in patience and forbearance teaches me the word of God. And then what do I do? In the same brotherly love, I remember them. I give them my attention. I allow them to take my focus. I give them my uttermost uh, uh, best in my attention. Why? Because I am to recognize that the word of God that they speak unto me is everything that they can give unto me. What do I then do? I follow faith. I follow their sound doctrine. What do I also do? By extension, I do not follow what is not sound doctrine. What am I still doing? 
I'm letting brotherly love continue. It, see, if it, it is an act of irresponsibility as a believer, when you have listened to that which is not faith, and you are still following it, right? We are to follow faith in our leaders, which means we are to follow soundness of doctrine. Praise God. Soundness of God. Why? My, my ruler or my elder or my bishop or my pastor or my shepherd is my brother. And as my brother, I follow him in the faith. I follow him in soundness of doctrine. I follow him in the teaching of Jesus Christ. I consider the end or, or I consider the goal, the, the purpose of their conduct. Amen. So when the Bible now says in verse 17, obey them, it means be persuadable by them. Because there's no use you listening to a man that cannot persuade you. Let me say it again. Whoever you cannot give your heart's attention to cannot be a blessing to you spiritually. In fact, that act of giving your heart's attention to a person is what the Bible calls honor. Your honor is, I'm, I'm actually making myself vulnerable to you. I'm allowing myself to be persuaded by you. And I'm anticipating that you are going to use the word of God to do the job. In other words, we will use the word of God to say what the Lord once said and what the apostles have emphasized. Praise God. Amen. We, we, that's what we do. That's the Bible obedience. Let me say it again. Obey in Hebrews 13, 17. It's not the same thing as obey in Ephesians 6. When many people are talking about obeying, they really have Ephesians 6 kind of obedience in mind. Ephesians 6 verse 1 says, children, obey your parents, right? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, right? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, but when it comes to my relationship, to my leaders, it tells me I'm to obey. Well, the KJV calls it obey, but the word really means be persuadable. Don't be, don't be unpersuadable. What does that mean? It means that the nature of what my pastor, wait, what, what is my pastor telling me? Now, my pastor is giving me the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? My, my, my pastor is actually uh, rebuking, refuting, yeah, commanding. But how is he doing it? In a spirit of, I'm persuading this guy. So a pastor that does not conduct things so as to persuade, is not, is not actually doing a good job. Or a member of a church, a saint, whose pastor is doing the best job at persuasion, persuasion but will not yield himself. Such a person is a misnomer in the local church. So in Hebrews 13 and verse 17, it then says, obey. That word obey means be persuadable by them that have the rule over you. Submit yourself. What are you submitting yourselves to? The submission of yourself is making your heart vulnerable to be persuaded. But then what are you doing? Are you just opening your mouth like a day old chicken and saying, well, ki sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. And whatever my pastor says, that's it. No. Why? Because uh, it will not tell you to do that and then tell you, if I'm not supposed to be designing, it will not tell me actually considering the end of your conversation. And then it says in verse uh, 9, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Hey, where is it coming from? It's coming from, in context, what my brother, the pastor, has taught me. What my, all my sister, the pastor, has taught me. So in, in the teaching of my pastor, I am supposed to be able to say, uh-uh, that is a diverse and strange doctrine, and that is the faith of Christ. I'm, I'm supposed to. Whose job is it? My job. Who should make sure I am not carried about? Normally, my pastor should be there to protect. But if my pastor himself is not there to protect because he may be the one spreading the stuff, what am I to do? Hebrews 13, 9 says, be not carried about. That means you must see to it that you are not carried about. So, and why are you doing that? Brotherly love. It is not the practice of brotherly love to listen to that, which is a diverse and strange doctrine, yeah, which is something that is not establishing you in grace. Look at verse 9. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. So as a saint, what, how do I know that the rule of my pastor over me is bearing the, truth, uh, the good fruit? My heart will be established in, faith, in grace. My heart will be established in grace. Right? Now, what happens? How am I going to judge? Therefore, but think about this carefully. It's very likely that your pastor will know more than you. Very likely. Now, so if my pastor or since my pastor should know more than me, does that mean that I am not going to be able to know when I am being carried around or not? No. The writer of Hebrews, verse 13, 13 verse 7, that is exactly why it was written. 
Remember them that have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. What is it you follow? Follow their faith. Who determines what you follow? You determine what you follow. Who gives you the things to follow? People do. Who determines whether you will follow or not? You do. How will you know? You consider. Considering the end of their conversation. Consider. That means that there is something inherent in the word of God that is able to protect a person from uh, trusting their pastor. What does it mean trust your pastor? You pay attention to the word of God they teach. But in paying attention, you consider. Yeah, you have to pay. At, see, the Bible doesn't teach blind obedience, doesn't teach blind submission. The Bible doesn't teach all that kind of stuff. You, yeah, the flesh or the loss of the flesh and worldliness wants that, but that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible that tells you to remember them that have the rule over you in verse 7, then tells you two verses after, don't be carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. What will be the diverse and strange doctrines? It will be whatever doctrine does not establish your heart in the grace of God. What did Paul say on this matter? Galatians. Galatians and chapter 1. Galatians 1 and verse 6. I marvel that you, Galatians, you are so soon removed from him that called you into the gospel of Christ unto another gospel. So Paul implies that it is possible for the same to be moved from the gospel to another gospel, yet the Bible has been opened and is the local assembly and things are just going weird. Look at verse 6 again. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Will it not be funny if the Galatians then said, oh, but Paul, you know now that our teachers know so much more than us that we are their mercy and there's no way we could have stopped ourselves from being removed. But apparently Paul said, uh-uh, I marvel. You guys, I marvel that you are so soon removed. In fact, look at what he told them in chapter 3. In chapter 3, he said, Oh foolish Galatians. So he knew that within the brotherhood of the saints, right, the believer has what it takes to be able to give attention to the word of God, to consider what is being said, to judge it by the conduct of the speaker, and to judge it by, does he establish my heart in grace or not? Amen. He said, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? So can a Christian be bewitched in the local church? Yeah. In fact, that is the only place a Christian can be bewitched. Can a Christian be bewitched in, in the local assembly? Yep. How does it happen when the Christian is acting foolish? Yeah, Galatians and chapter 3 and verse 1. Yeah, it says, oh, foolish Galatians. Why will he call them foolish? Number one, let me tell you what that word that is foolish there means. Yeah, the word foolish there, it means unintelligent, lacking understanding, unwise, right? Or see, they are not intelligent, they lack understanding. Okay, let's go back to them. So Galatians 3 1, oh, unintelligent and lacking understanding Galatians. To whom did he talk? He spoke directly to each saint in the Galatian church and said, you're foolish. In other words, you are unintelligent. Yeah, he said, who has bewitched you? Who has? In other words, it takes a man, it takes what you listen to, to bewitch you. You know what is funny? God has sent men. God became a man, and as a man he died, and as a man he rose. God has sent men. And interestingly, it is men that edify us, I this men that actually cause us trouble. Now, who, what is your place? Your place is to know the kind of man you are listening to. Oh, somebody says, no, no, no. How dare I think about such things? Then before long, you're going to be bewitched. Look at it again. It says, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? The Greek word for bewitched, eh, let me tell you what it means. It means to slander, to bring evil on one by feigning praise or an evil eye, to charm. In other words, Paul is saying that the effect of bad doctrine on the Christian is as good as the Christian has been spoken ill of, or the Christian evil has been brought upon the Christian. There is no immorality as immoral as bad doctrine. There is nothing that damages a believer like listening to something that looks and sounds like the gospel, but is so, so not the gospel, right? What does he do? He removes the heart from being established in the grace of God. 
Look at it. What did Paul expect the Galatians to do? Galatians 3 1. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? You should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth. You see, that word evidently set forth, it means as it has been written before. Written where? In the scriptures. So Paul is saying, sorry, I've taken the scriptures. I've taken the word of God. I've opened Genesis through Malachi, and in it I preached to you Christ crucified. So what happened to you? That you abandoned that, and you allowed people to talk to you, and it bewitched you, or it became an evil speech. You see, bad doctrine is evil speech. Let me tell you what that means. That means that Paul is expecting that the Corinthians, or sorry, that the Galatians will Pay close attention to what anybody comes to tell them. No, somebody says, no, 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 no. It means that every other person but their pastor, because their pastor will tell them what is nice, and if they, should work, they should not examine their pastor. They should examine everybody else. Really? Now go back to Galatians 1. Let's see that what Paul said. Galatians 1 and verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ, unto and not that gospel. Okay, which is not another. So when he said another gospel, the Greek word used in that verse 6 of another, it means of a different kind. So yeah, uh, uh, they've moved you onto a gospel of a different kind. Verse 7 now says, which is not another. That means of the same kind. So he's saying they've moved you to something different, which is not of the same kind that you are taught before. Verse 7 says, which is not another, but there be some. That means men. Right, but there be some that trouble you. There be some that trouble you. Galatians and chapter one, verse uh, verse seven. Where does the Christian experience tribulation? Where does the Christian experience trouble? The Christian experiences trouble firstly in their contact with bad doctrine. Bad doctrine can damage a believer far more than persecution from the world ever can. Let me say it again. It says there be some which do what which will trouble you. Yeah. It says the trouble you. What do they do? Yeah. There be some that trouble. Now, what is that word trouble? Let me read for you. That word trouble, it means to agitate. Yeah. To cause inward commotion. To take away your calmness in your mind. To disturb your calm. To disquiet you. To make you restless. To stir you up. Right to render anxious, to distress, to perplex the mind, to suggest doubt. That's what the word means. So let's look at it again. Now it says, but they will trouble you. Yeah, they will trouble you. Verse 7. They trouble you. So they, it is preachers that introduce disquiet, restlessness, the loss of calm, the loss of confidence, the loss of sound thinking. You see, in our day, there ought to be a revival of sound and good thinking. What does bad doctrine do? It removes from the believer the ability and the responsibility to think. It removes from the believer the calm. That's, see, sound doctrine brings calm. On sound doctrine removes that calm. Why? Because it, pose, it focuses the mind on irrelevances in the local church. So it says, it says in verse 7, there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. Okay, see, so he's talking about preachers. He says, and look at verse 8. Somebody says, yes, yes, yes. Paul is, uh, Paul means other people. But look at verse 8. He says, though we. Oh, so Paul included himself. So Paul wanted the Galatians to look at him and examine what he's saying and to say, is this another gospel of a different kind or is this another gospel of the same kind? Is this that same gospel that was preached to us that brought us peace? Or is this something that sounds like it's camouflaged in the same words, but it is not the same thing? It says in verse 8, Galatians 1 8, but though we or an angel from heaven, though we or an angel from heaven, though we or an angel from heaven, we means Paul is including himself, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him whoever that person be, let him be accursed. That means don't touch. Don't treat as something you give attention to. Or let's put it better, don't honor. You get it now? That means you're not going to keep on exposing your heart and making your... See, why, what happened to the Galatians? They were listening, 
and in listening, they were not considering. The people were robbing them of the calm, of the solid thinking, of the of the poise, of the uh, you know, of their posture of uh, of certainty in Christ, uh, and they were being dragged onto irrelevances, mundanities, and all those things that did not contribute anything whatsoever to their spiritual growth. Okay, and you can tell because when things contrary to the grace of Christ are spoken, your heart's confidence goes. When it happens, the first time you will know it. Yeah, see, I'm not saying you're going to know as much as your pastor. Really, it's going to take a while. If a, if a good pastor is going to keep on improving himself, so it's going to take you a while. But the Bible doesn't say that the Christian is at the mercy of the pastor only. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. The pastor prays a good part, but the Christian in listening and in growing will be able to come to a point where we should be able to tell the Christian, you too, you're a foolish Christian. You're, you're a foolish Galatian. You have been bewitched. In other words, you know what is funny? You will have thought that Paul will have said, ah, you ministers, why did you teach them so, so, and so? Instead, he went after the Galatians. Like, why were you listening to such? You are foolish Galatians. You have been bewitched. What does that mean? It means that the power of a minister to trouble you was submitted by you to the minister. Let me say one more time. Since the Bible says, in, look at Galatians, I want you to listen carefully. But though we, Galatians 1.8, but though we, O an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached. So Paul is saying, even if I myself, I come back. And I start telling you something different from that gospel by which you were saved before. It says, let him, yeah, that means the angel or Paul himself, let him be accursed, right? That simply means don't touch, don't handle, don't treat with any dignity. Don't handle, don't consider something that you will begin to say, I'm going to order my life by. You've listened, you've considered it, it doesn't tarry with the word of God. Look at it, say, let him be accursed, stop. So now, if you don't treat it as accursed, then it's going to come to a point by Galatians 3, you will be foolish and bewitched. Let me say it again. It means that the power to be bewitched and the power to be foolish and the power not to be bewitched and the power not to be foolish and the power to treat the message as a cost is the, a power belonging to the brotherhood. So saints are, are the power an inoculation of sorts, have a power and ability above deception that most people ignore. Yeah, Paul said to the Galatians, he says, uh -uh, if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we are preached, in other words, you are meant to take what has been true to check what is being said. Uh, somebody said, uh, your pastor is talking and you're analyzing it. Yes, why? so that you want to be sure that the gospel of Christ has not been perverted. To whom do you do that? Those that, you, those that you've even bought that to listen to. So it's an act of love. It's an act of spiritual sensibility that when I'm in the local church, I am thinking, pondering, weighing, judging, right? I'm actually considering. So, it, 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 uh, and what helps me? I take down notes. When I leave the service, I go back and I check it. I'm checking my heart. Well, I'm checking, uh, this, uh, for as long as these things have been said, I've lost my peace, my calm, I'm in disarray, I'm, di I'm disquieted, I'm not as calm as I used to be, I'm agitated, I'm distressed. Then go back to what you've been listening to. Go back to, don't say, oh, no, 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 I, I can't do it that way. You must do it that way. Why? Because as a believer, you place premium on words. As a believer, as a Christian, you place a high premium on words. Paul said, if he himself or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That means the power of a minister is not with the minister, it's with the congregation that give him attention. Let me say this one more time. The power of a minister to bless or the power of a minister to confuse, the power of a minister to strengthen, or the power of a minister to bring into trouble is not with the minister, funny enough, it is with the congregation. That is why the, 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 the believer is then told to honor. That means you are giving that minister a power that is yours, that you can take back at any time. How are you giving that power? You are making your hearts exposed. You are listening, pondering, thinking, considering. 
You are giving it your attention, right? You're not switching off. You're switched on. You're not being foolish or bewitched. You are listening carefully. You don't want to end up like the Galatian Christians. You want to be somebody that is a better version of the Bereans. You want to give it your thoughts. But that's what Paul advised. Galatians 1, verse 8. Though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have received, uh, that we have preached unto you, let him be, let him be accursed. As we have said before, verse 9, he repeats himself. As we have said before, so say I now again. If any man, Paul includes himself. So it is fallacy of the highest order to say, ah, Pasiku, don't worry. When you are teaching, I don't bother to even check it. But when any other minister is preaching, I check it. The Bible calls that carnality. Now, think about this carefully. Let me say that again so you hear me well. Really, the more you listen to a person and the more you prove that person to be accurate, the more your guts come down. That is true. There's nothing anybody can do about that. The more you relate to a person and the more you find what that person is saying to be edifying, the more your guts come down. But spirituality is, hey, I'm making myself trust you, but I'm going to think. I'm going to consider. I'm going to weigh. I'm going to remember, right? Because that's the way I submit. So I'm making myself available to be taught the word of God, but I'm not going to be foolish. I'm not going to be bewitched. You see, and that's what people forget. It's not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. Number one, honor comes from the minister to the congregation. A honorable minister does not take the word of God and twist it in teaching it to the congregation and say, congregation, honor me. That is his honor. What should the congregation do? They listen and they treat that as accursed. Because Paul said, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That's a figure of speech referring to what has been preached and is calling it the old man. Of course, it's not the man himself. It's what he has said. So he has preached. Let what he has said really be accursed. That means you will treat that one and say, uh-uh, Mark, not fit for consumption. That's all. Verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. So I am to take the gospel I've already received and use it to weigh every other thing I hear. The moment there's a departure, so somebody says, ah, don't worry, that one is new creation reality. That other one is our identity in Christ. This other one is totally different. Forget, forget all that what Christ has done. This one is now reality. Ah, a reality apart from what Christ has done. Oh, no, somebody says, no, 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 no. You know, forget about all that thinking things through, right? You have to know that there are just some things you are said that way. When things start sounding that way, you are in red flag territory. Red flag territory. Right? What do you do? If you're not careful, Paul is going to come to you and he's going to tell you in Galatians 3 and say, you know what, verse 1, you're a foolish Galatian. You've been bewitched. Yeah? What should you have done? You should obey the truth. Hallelujah. 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 Look at Galatians 3 1 again. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? So here is an, a man of God, a woman of God, yet it, with a cassock. Yeah, you know, a senior prophesying prophet, an apostle, a man, yeah? Now, preaching and teaching the word of God, what do you obey? Before you obey the man, you obey the truth, right? You obey the truth. You say, oh, the truth of the gospel says this. I have weighed that with what this man is saying or what this woman is saying. Mm -mm, it doesn't tally. So what you do, you say, I'm not submitting myself. All this is going on in your mind, though. I'm not submitting myself to folly. It is foolishness. When I have been exposed to the word of, or word of God, and there's no Christian that has not been exposed to the word of God, you see the fundamentals. Now, here's the trouble. Many people have not even, when you go back to examine the fundamentals they had, in, in becoming Christians, what were they told? If you want a better marriage, come to Jesus and give him your life. You know, that's not the gospel. Or if you want a better, better future, just come to him and give him your life. Or if you want a good, uh, good job, no, that's not the gospel. The gospel says and starts with, you have no life. God has the life. He is the life. His son has come. He gives you the life in the resurrection, the forgiveness of sins. You believe that? Life is yours. It's not very simple. But you see, if you don't get that, and that in that believing, you will become the brother of God, made one with him and equal with him in redemption, then you, if you don't have those basics, 
then the foundation is when the foundation is missing. Oh, what would the righteous do? So it says in Galatians 3, 1, let me say it again. In the mind of God, of course, the pastor, the leader, the group lead, the cell lead should preach and teach the word of God, should prioritize the word of God. But it is still ultimately your responsibility, the deliver, not to be the foolish Galatian or the bewitched Galatian. Right? And it says, how does a man become bewitched? He sees the truth and he sees a man. He prioritizes the man over the truth. And the man is removing his peace, but he follows the man, abandons the truth. When that happens, we say, such a man has not obeyed the truth, in which case he is a first-class bewitched believer. He is a foolish Christian. He's a Christian. He's a brother. He's one for whom Christ died. He's sanctified, accepted in the Lord. Yeah, we love that believer, right? But that believer has now won for themselves in adjective, foolish and bewitched. Now, how does a Christian get foolish and bewitched? It's not by saying, I won't be foolish. I won't be foolish. In the name of Jesus, I will not be foolish. I will not be bewitched. No, it is by learning to discern truth and to obey it, right? So there'll be a minister in front of you and there'll be the truth. And the minister should be a minister of the truth. But when minister and truth are going different ways, minister is going south, truth is going north. You are meant to say, oh, okay, 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 okay. Thus far I obey, afterwards I cannot. Why? Because I am going to always obey the truth 100%. Let me say differently. Uh, 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 Hebrews 13. Go back to Hebrews 13. So Paul's, Paul was, even our pastor or our cell leader is not exempt from being evaluated as per what he's telling us. We evaluate the words because Christianity is the great confession. When a man is preaching and teaching us, we are evaluating it against the truth of God's word. Is that magnifying Christ? Is that magnifying the work of God in Christ? Is that magnifying brotherhood? Is that magnifying the saints? Or is it glorifying one man? And it's okay if that one man is Jesus. But if that one man is not Jesus, then there's likely to be red flags everywhere. Hebrews 13 and verse 7. Yeah, verse 1 says, let brotherly love continue. What you call honor. Let brotherly love continue. The love of brethren. So in, in the brotherhood, there will, uh, there will be a fellowship, in the assembly, and we have elders that stand to minister to us. Look at verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you. What do they have over us? The rule. What is the rule? Ah, somebody said, it means that they are senior to us, superior to us. No matter what happens, they are far, 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 far. They are like the second born that rose after Jesus. No. No. My honor for my man of God is that every time he opens his mouth, that the word of God is going to pour out. I'm anticipating edification. I'm anticipating the good word of God. But I don't leave it at that because the Bible doesn't tell me to leave it at that. I don't go blind. It says I'm to remember. I'm to follow by considering. So, see, so I'm going to consider. Paul will say, uh, 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 if any man, yeah, if we or an angel comes to preach to you any other gospel other than that gospel that will preach to you before, let him be a cost. So, a, a good pastor helps the people realize that when I depart from the word of God, if I depart from the word of God, right? then you should understand that you have to give attention to the word of God. And just to be careful, in case you think what I'm saying is not the word of God, and that what you think is the word of God, ask me questions. In the asking of the questions, I will see where your mind is at. We will sit down as brethren. Oh, la la. We will sit down as brethren. We will talk about the things of brotherhood. And I will seek to persuade you and your thoughts in verse 17 of Hebrews 13 is you'll be looking to be persuadable. But in the middle of all, of all that, when you see that what has been said is not the word of God, in honor for me, in love for me, in your brotherly love for me, you will not succumb to that which will end up making you to be the foolish Galatian or the bewitched Galatian. What is a bewitched Galatian? It's a figure of speech <laughs> for a saint. Who refuses to obey the truth, but out of fear for man, will obey man and say, ah, oh, I don't want to enter into anybody's bad book. So I don't, well, sincerely, as a Christian, you cannot afford to belittle the word of God, full stop. You can't. 
What makes us different from Islam or, or, or different from Buddhism, right, is our preference for our being sticklers for the Word of God. The Word of God. And the Word of God then trains us to listen to our leaders, but tells us how to listen. We call to mind, we'll ponder, we'll consider, and then we will make sure that we are not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. That's it. Now, if you say it that way, you've listened to honor. In fact, you've listened honorably. A honorable believer makes a solid saint. He's a right-thinking believer, not foolish or bewitched. Amen. Not foolish or bewitched. See, it's very important. Very, very important. Amen. Yeah, very, very important. Very, very important. Because not understanding this, people get into all manner of trouble. Look at Proverbs 29, 25. Proverbs, yeah. Before I read Proverbs, let me read Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember them. Remember them. See, there are certain people you must remember in your life. Who are they? The people that have the rule over you. you say, if you say you don't have anybody that has a rule over you, then you are, you are grossly mistaken. Who are those that have the rule over you? Those that speak to you, the word of God. It is those people that when they are talking, you take it that that's God's word. Whenever you get to a point in your life, and you should, where you begin to consider certain people to be those that train you in the word of God, because of the importance of that word, you are now going to start remembering. You will give it your endless attention. And you will say, okay, you know what? What am I going to follow? Uh, let me say it again. You are not so much following the man as you are following faith, right? Say, so whose faith follow? Because when you remove that faith aspect, and you say, follow. What's going to happen is you become blind. When the person makes a mistake, you fall into the mistake. When the person is on the right path, you're on the right path. But that's not God's plan. The truth is, let me say it again. Anybody you listen to already means you trust. Anybody you keep on listening to already means that your heart is vulnerable to. The more vulnerable your heart is to a person, the Bible standard is you are to judge what they say. How many times? All the time by considering the, the end of their conduct. You see, there are certain things you may not see in the Hebrew of Aramaic of Greek of Ethiopian, but you will see in conduct. You will see it. It will come to you clearly. You might close your eyes to it, right? But it will come to you clearly, and it begins to tell you, oh, so this person's conduct, or uh, this person's doctrine is really exemplified in that conduct. Oh, I get it now. And although I might not be as, think about this carefully. If, if you have a man who has 60 years in ministry, and you just got born again five years ago. Clearly the person, if they've been smart at all, they have many years of advantage over you. But what they don't have over you is that you will think. Mm -mm. Every believer. See, the scriptures imply, if I'm told to remember, it means that the Bible, the word of God is full, uh, has already placed a power in my remembering. So in my remembering, what am I going to remember? Galatians says so well, you have to remember the word that you believed at the beginning right? It says they have spoken unto you the word of God. You follow their faith. How? Considering. Yeah? Somebody says, well, my group leader said it, that settles it. Then you are a very foolish Galatian. Bewitched in fact. Okay? Bewitched in fact. Cultic. No. As a believer, you honor the word of God, number one. You honor the brotherhood, number two. And in the brotherhood, you find those men that rule over us that you are then honoring. Let me say it again. If your honor for the brotherhood is not intact, any honor you have for anybody else, it's going to be counterfeit. I'm going to say that one more time. A believer whose definition of honor can be trusted is a believer, number one, that has the highest regard for the word of God, Number two, as the highest regard for the local assembly or the brotherhood, and in that as the regard for the pastor. In that order. Let me say it one more time. In that order. You see, because when you don't have honor for the brotherhood, and you are saying, but I honor one man, you are a candidate for becoming hoodwinked. I want you to be clear to anybody listening tonight, right? Real Bible honor is the honor of the brethren. See, Hebrews 13, 1, let brotherly love, the love of brethren for one another, let that continue. Because in the, let me say it again. Yeah, what is going to happen to you if in verse 9, you then discover that you are being carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. You might not take that pastor serious, but you must still take the brotherhood serious. 
You get the point. So pastor comes, pastor goes. Pastor might be right or not right, but the honor for the brotherhood is our protection. We honor the brotherhood. So Christians must be able to sit down with Christians and say, let us reason the word of God together. Right? You don't sit down in your corner and then say, well, I just don't think that uh, that's what pastor said is right. No. Number one, think it true. Number two, ask pastor. Number three, if you're still not convinced, call the brethren together. Sit down with brothers. Oh, somebody says, no, how can you call the brothers? Because brotherly love is to continue. What will brotherly love do? It will help us not be carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Hebrews 13 verse 9. See, let me tell you again. Will you go to the Judaizers? Go back to Galatians. Before I stop tonight, Galatians. Galatians and chapter 2. Galatians and chapter 2. Verse 4 says, And because false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Now, these will have been brethren, will have been telling some things to Paul. They will have been explaining some things to Paul. What did Paul do in verse 5? To whom we gave place by subjection. Can you see subjection? So the subjection of believers to ministers is not 100%. Mm -mm. The subjection to the brotherhood, the subjection to the word of God, it's, it's, that, that one is, that one is 100%. But there are believers that you come across who, when they say certain things, you'll be like, uh-uh, uh-uh. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. Why? That the truth. So men can be like yo-yo, up today, down tomorrow. Sound exegesis, poor exegesis. Solid doctrine, poor doctrine. Right? Uh, solid gospel, perverted gospel. But the word of God, the truth of a gospel abides forever. So your honor for the truth of a gospel has to be of a very serious level. Otherwise, you can't be taken. You're not a serious Christian. Verse 5 says, to whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour. So there are people, there are ministers that Paul said, mm -mm, we didn't give them space. But he says, why? Because of the truth of the gospel. That, that, uh, yeah. So we submit always to the truth of the gospel. But we may not always submit to what men are saying, although we love the men. I want to get the difference. We love the man, but we are not required to love what the man is saying. I love the man. That's why I gave the man my attention, brother I love. In what the man is saying, I am not required to love it. I'm required to remember, which means to consider so as to find what to follow. So what do I follow? That which agrees with the truth of the gospel. So I love what my pastor is, a brother. I am not required to love what my pastor says. I'm to judge. So pastor, pastor I love. Leader of a group, I love. Right? I love the brethren. Let brotherly love continue. Once they start speaking, I now start saying, okay, I love the man speaking. What he's saying, uh, before I say I love it, I'm going to judge it. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to ponder it. Oh, somebody says, no, 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 no. Who are you as a Christian? You are judging what that's what I said. That means Paul should not have judged what was said in Jerusalem. But he judged it. And he said, no, no, no. Peter, see, look at it again. He said concerning Peter, he says in verse 3, but, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So Paul was watching out for it. Let me see if they will compel. If they compel, I can't agree. And they didn't compel. Good stuff. But then said some other guys, false brethren. Uh-huh. Those ones who are compelling what they ought not to compel. And what would they have done? They would likely have quoted. Look at Romans 15. Sorry, Acts 15. Acts 15 and verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught. So these are ministers. There's no escaping it. They are ministers and they are teachers, in fact. They taught the brethren. That means they are people of standing. Yeah? They taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised. After the manner of Moses. So this tells us that this thing happened in Antioch. We know it happened. It says, it says there are certain men which came down from Judea. So it did not happen in Judea. It happened in Antioch. We know it was Antioch because they went back to read this in Antioch. Now, it says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, I want you to say it, that's Acts 15, uh, 1, go all the way down. Uh, yeah. It says uh, here, uh, verse 22, Then pleased eat the apostles 
and elders with the old church to send chosen men of their company to Antioch. Can you see? To Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, son named Barnabas, and Silas, and chief men among the brethren. So actually, funny enough, people were still bearing Judas after that interesting Judas in there. So Judas is not a bad name, okay? For some reason, people don't bear it, but it's nothing. It's the same thing as Judah. Anyway, what it says here, they sent them to Antioch. So why did they send them to Antioch? Because the problem was in Antioch. Look at Acts 51. And certain men which came down from Judea, come, came down to where? To Antioch. Taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So they were teachers. And they were teaching the brethren that. Verse 2. When the Apostle Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, Somebody says, oh, that means Paul and Barnabas are dishonorable. Or that means Paul and Barnabas are not, uh, they are not good Christians. They're rebellious. No, they're, just, they're actually being non-foolish, non-bewitched. So when, therefore, Paul and Barnabas had no, you know what, Paul and Barnabas, they made a big show of it. They, they disputed. Why? So that the truth of the gospel will not be put to shame. Amen. Go back to it again. Galatians. Galatians and chapter 1. It says in verse 8, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preached unto you, let him be. Let him be accursed. Let him be what? Accursed. It's not the man they are cursing. They, are refer they let him, it's a figure of speech for what he has said. What he has said is another gospel. So let that thing that that man has said let him be accursed. So they love the man if he's a brother. And because brotherly love is to continue. In fact, the act of listening to people that teach is brotherly. And then the act of judging what they say is brotherly. When a man says that, uh, or is speaking, and he says, I'm speaking the gospel, and I judge what he's saying, I am in brotherly love. When the man is speaking and I'm opening my mouth like a day old chicken, I am not in brotherly love. I may be the world that needs to be saved. But as a Christian, to be in brotherly love means to consider accurately, precisely. You give it your attention. What has been said? Is Christ glorified? Is attention being pushed on the man? Or is it being pushed on the brethren, the local assembly, the church together, us together? Now, who helps us put the focus on the local assembly? They are people that have the rule over us. So the, the aim of the pastor is not to be the one man that takes the place of Jesus. No. The aim of the pastor is to make the saints become more certain about the indwelling of Jesus, to be more certain about the ability to design, to be more certain about the beauty and the power of brotherhood, and then to, be, to learn to judge what anybody says in fellowship. Praise God. To so judge what anybody says in fellowship. That's when, it's, that, that's when our coming together is beautiful. Now, I'm going to say this one more time, and I want to hear it. Since Paul said, yeah, I want, look, look at it again. Romans and chapter 15. Why do I keep this in Romans? Acts 15. So certain teachers came and taught. Verse 2, Paul had no small dissension. What does that mean? The power of that teacher to influence Paul and Barnabas was not with the teacher, it was with Paul and Barnabas. If Paul and Barnabas did not remember and did not consider and did, do you understand, and did not follow faith, then they would just simply have sat like they old chickens and received such rubbish. So the power of a minister to influence you, so let's, say, let's say it again, men can influence men, if you're, except you're not a man. You are influenceable, you are already influenced. I speaking to you, I'm influenced. So why? Because man is a product of influence. So man influences man. In fact, that's why I'm able to preach to you the gospel and you received it because we influenced you with the word of God. So men influence men, right? But however, in men influencing men, I have a choice as to who influences me. What do I use to choose that? I choose it by choosing the word of God. I, I give the word of God first place. I now use the word of God. Yeah, ask my yastic for what anybody says. So that when these guys began to teach what they were teaching in uh, Acts 15, then Paul said to them, uh, Paul and Barnabas said, mm, 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 mm. not at all. Look at Galatians. Galatians and chapter 2. 
It says in verse 4, And because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us unto bondage to whom we gave place by subjection. So who gives place to a minister for the minister to have power? <laughs> it is the congregation. What does God give us? God gives us men as gifts to teach us his word. Let me say it again. God's gift to you is not a particular man. God's gift to you is men that teach the word of God. You see, because if God's gift to you is a particular man, then when or if the man gets into error, you are in trouble. You are done for. No. What does God give to you? Think about this carefully. Was, did God send Paul to Galatia? Yes. How could he then tell them if we or any other, any angel from heaven, preach any other gospel, let him be a cost? It means that what Paul was given to be a gift about was the revelation of Jesus. Amen. The rev See, all, it is true that we say that God has given to us men as gifts. Let's be clear about it. The men he gives to us, are the, the gifts in the men is the revelation of Jesus. A man is a gift to the extent to which it teaches you about the gift. <laughs> Glory to God. A man is a gift to the extent to which he magnifies Christ the gift. But a man that colors or blinds your eyes and prevents you from seeing Christ the gift and magnifies himself is not a gift. It's fast becoming a trouble and a thorn in your side. Let me say one more time. I, as your pastor, I am a gift given to you to the extent to which I preach no other gospel but the, but the gospel of grace, the gospel of Christ. When, what happens when I depart? You then say in your mind, you judge it, you look at it, and you're like, okay, that one we're not going to follow. Why? Because the gift that is given is Christ. And Christ is ministered through men. See, the focus is not the man. The focus is not the specific individual. The focus is the man, Jesus, unveiled in the ministry of men. You see, the Bible says that the spirit of, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus. Paul said, when I came among you, I sought to know nothing but Christ. We preach not ourselves, but Christ. Can you see? We don't preach us. We don't preach me. We don't preach I. We preach Christ, the man, that man, our man, <laughs> that man, Jesus. That's the one we preach. Amen. That's the one we preach. I'm, I'm going to say one more time. Yeah. The, the power by which a man influences you is not an inherent power in the man. The power by which a woman influences you is not an inherent power in the woman. It is the level of attention and the level of reverence and the level of vulnerability that you expose from your heart to the person, that is what gives the person the power. Where do you start? You give yourself vulnerable. And then what happens? As you are listening, you begin to say, okay, okay, okay. My heart is not going to take that one. Mm -mm 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 -mm. My heart is not going to take that one. See, Acts 15, and I stop. Acts 15. It says, certain men, verse 1, certain men which came down from Judea, taught the brethren and said, except that you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension. Can you see it now? Paul and Barnabas were different because they were brethren who will not accept into their heart that which they know not to be consistent with the revelation of Jesus. Let me say it again. Men have been given to us as gifts to unveil the gift. A man's giftedness is in his power to unveil Christ as gift. When a man is no longer unveiling Christ as gift, he is not a gift. Let me say it again. When the, God uses men, and the men he uses, we are to remember, we are to consider, we are to make ourselves persuadable by them. We give them all our attention. We, we start out vulnerable to them. How do you start at a church service? You are vulnerable to the minister. As the message is going on, you begin to withdraw your heart. Oh, no, no, no. That one there, that contravenes the gospel of Christ. You're not going to take it. Why? Because the moment you begin to take it, evil communication will corrupt your good manners and sound doctrine. Evil communication. Poor. See, what did Peter, Paul and Barnabas do? They listened. They, list, they allowed the men to land. What did they teach? So it's not that the person said one thing, you jump up and say, I disagree. No, no. You let people land. You listen. We, they are brethren. We love them. 
We might not like what they are saying, but we love them. So we give them honor in that we listen to what they are saying and we listen attentively and we listen thoroughly. When we've seen this, when we've seen the uh, the conclusion, then like Paul and Barnabas, no small dissension, no dis uh, and disputation, or in Galatia, to whom we gave place, no, no, no at all. Or like Paul himself, uh, uh, um, a counsel in Galatians 1 8, he says, if we, if we, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Hebrews and 13 and verse 7, right? Or verse 17. Now you understand verse 17. It says, Obey them that have the rule over you. What is your obey? Let yourself be persuadable by. What if what you're saying is not in line with the gospel? Then you don't get yourself to be persuaded by. You are submitting yourself. And you are giving yourself, you are obeying verse 7. Verse 7 is what verse 7 is talking about. As you begin to do that, then the local assembly gets stronger. The local assembly gets more rich. The local assembly gets to a point where it is the ground of truth. We love the speaker. We never hate the speaker. We love the speaker. We love our leaders. We are fanatical about our leaders. We are more fanatical about the truth. We are more fanatical about the gospel. We are more fanatical about our liberty in Christ. And when the men go top to top, we allow the stability of the gospel to calm our hearts. What have we done? We've obeyed. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, guys, 